The History with Jackson podcast. Hello and welcome back to the History with Jackson podcast. In this episode, I am talking to Dr. Simon Elliott, who has come back on the podcast to talk about his brand new book with casemate Vandal Heaven, reinterpreting post-Roman North Africa. Now, this was a fascinating episode, a great book that really addresses some misconceptions that we'd have on the region, but also on its Roman rule. Now, if you enjoy this episode or any of the other episodes or history content that we have here at History of Jackson, the home of accessible and digestible history, please do consider dropping us a review on your podcast player, a comment on YouTube, or even a comment on some of the articles. Now, without further ado, I'll leave you with Dr. Simon Elliott. So hello and welcome back to the History of Jackson podcast. Today we welcome back friend of the podcast, historian Dr. Simon Elliott to talk about his soon-to-be-released book with casemate Vandal Heaven, Reinterpreting Post-Roman North Africa. Now we are so early to this one that I don't even have a physical copy of this one yet. Do you Do you have one yet, Simon? I don't, I don't know. It's actually due out in about a week's time. Um, and it's only a couple of weeks ago that I actually signed off the uh, the final proofs and it's now being printed. So I absolutely can't wait. One of the reasons I can't wait, by the way, is because it's ran with full colour photographs from my travels in the region, including the front cover, which is one of my favourite pictures I've ever taken. Um, and I was really lucky when I sort of travelled travelled there last year in particular. I've travelled to North Africa before, but last year in particular, because the weather was – I went twice, once when it was snowing, <laughs> which is very unusual for the region and then once when it was incredibly green in the late spring so it's beautifully juxtaposed photographs from both trips it must be awesome as well <laughs> to have done the front cover for your own book as well i'm, I'm pretty jealous of that <laughs> it, it is and also of course um as, as many of your listeners will know uh i'm a huge um uh, uh um fan expert um and a knowledgeable person of Septimius Severus, the great warrior Roman emperor. And of course, I was able in the front cover picture, and you'll see this when you um, when you see a front cover of the book, to see that it's actually uh, it's from a, a, a Roman city called Jamila, which is in the Atlas Mountains in Algeria. And the image is through the Arch of Caracalla, who is the son of Septimius Severus, the eldest son, later emperor. And uh, you see in the background the Temple of the Genus Severus, which was built to celebrate Septimius Severus. So I've got a double Severum picture on the front cover. I, I think that's an easy win for you. I think that's a, that, that's a really nice win. But <laughs> <So> it is, mate. <laughs> well, what, what was the inspiration behind writing this particular book then, looking at reinterpreting post-Roman North Africa? Uh, as, as you know mate when you um are thinking about writing a book there are many different things that can inspire you so you can pluck out of the air a figure from history um that that you're you're fond of so for me julius caesar alexander the great you can uh, be reading somebody else's work and think to, to yourself oh that is really interesting i'll follow that thread and see where it goes this one was unique to me actually because it was actually all about travel because um, I've been to North Africa before, but last year I was fortunate to spend about two months in uh, Algeria uh, researching um, the Roman world and then leading tours there as well. Uh, and it was just absolutely mind-blowing going to a part of the Roman world about which I'd read a lot but knew personally little because I never visited there. And then suddenly having your eyes opened to all sorts of possibilities. And And, and one of the things that really struck me was how green it was so even when i went the first time at the beginning of march when it was snowing in the atlas mountains the the low the lowlands around the coast or in the high plains south of the atlas mountains um were green green as far as your eye can see and rolling hills and rolling hills if you like lord of the rings basically it's like uh, rohan and i've always thought of the vandals in particular as um like the rohirrim and then suddenly everything sort of slotted into place and i was i'd always wondered in the back of my mind why did Geyseric, who's one of the greatest generals in the, the ancient and uh, late antique world, never beaten, king for decades, founded the Vandal Kingdom in Africa, defeated all comers, anybody in the Roman world wanted to take you on got hammered. Why on earth did this um, uh, people from north of the Rhine, having hacked their way through Gaul and Spain over decades, decide to settle in North Africa, you know? 
surely it was going to be too hot and arid and you know they were horse people by then we wouldn't work for them and then it suddenly all fit into place actually for them when they arrived with a rolling even in the the the, the, the sort of like early spring late winter rolling green hills and things it was vandal heaven I, th- I think that's a nice like nice way of being inspired i think it's different coming from your travels and being able to see those places that you discuss in your book as well and you know who doesn't want to relate it to Lord of the Rings either? So, <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I can do actually, I can contextualize it. Okay, when I landed the first time, um, <clears throat> I uh, I was going to North Africa. I checked the weather; the weather seemed to be okay. I was flying into Algiers, and so I just packed a load of short sleeve shirts and one cagoule. And when I landed, it was literally snowing. And actually, the local agents who picked me up actually were almost sort of tapping me on the back saying, thank you for bringing the snow, because it only comes once every 10 years, and we needed some some rain and snow. And here you brought it with you. Um, but I'd only got short sleeve shirts, because that was my my prediction about the sort of weather conditions and where I was going. What was going to be, you know, it's going to be warm. You know, I'm going to go down to the Sahara Desert Frontier, which I did, the Roman lemurs on the Sahara Frontier Desert, which I did. And uh, I had to go and buy some new clothes to make sure that actually I was match fit because even when I was in the rolling green hills, even when I was on the Sahara fringe, it was only about five degrees maximum. And you have all your preconceptions overturned. And the beauty you get in North Africa in this part, so the part I'm working in is the region which was called Africa Pro Consularis to the Romans and then Mauritania as well to, to the West. So this is from modern Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco. And uh, all my preconceptions about the geography are overturned because you have this layer cake of geography going from the Mediterranean down to the Saharan fringe. You start off with the, the coastal plains, which are lush. <clears throat> you have the beautiful um, snow-capped Atlas Mountains. Then you have a high plain region. Uh, and then you have the Auries Mountains, which are like the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, sort of beautiful purple and blues. And then over there, the, the other side of that, you have the Saharan Fringe and the Saharan Desert begins. Um, so you have four regions there, not one. And of those in the ancient world, the, the coastal region was fertile. Uh, the the um, parts of the Atlas Mountains were fertile. The high plains were fertile. And then some of the gorges in the Aries Mountains were fertile as well. So therefore you go from this preconception oh, it's going to be desert or something. It's not, it's not at all. It's just basically, it's, it's, it's like an arable paradise. And you suddenly understand why this was the breadbasket of the Roman world and why it was the richest part of the Roman world, why it was a melting pot of ideas and power and influence. Because far from being a backwater, actually, it was a vastly, vastly, vastly important part of the Roman Empire. It's interesting how those preconceived notions can affect how you think of the re- uh, the region for Rome and, and for the Vandals. But as you just said, it's an incredibly important area. It's a hotbed of ideas. It's a nice arable land. And it's the breadbasket of the Roman Empire. But who were the region's native people then? And, and how did they become part of Rome? Great question again, actually, because again, it was really eye-opening for me. So again, as your, your, your listeners will know, one of the things I do is play toy soldiers, <clears throat> and I like playing toy soldiers in the ancient period, so I'm fully used to using Roman armies. I occasionally use a Vandal army, and actually I'm playing the competition in two weeks where I'm actually using Geyseric in a Vandal army, who in 10 practice games remains, like his real namesake, unbeaten which is probably actually giving me bad luck now. But anyway, um, and I know about the enemies of the late Romans, whether it's the Sassanid Persians, etc. I've even used Carthaginians before. I've never bothered with the Numidians. I've just thought of them as allies of the Carthaginians or the Romans in the, in the Punic Wars or the later Roman Civil Wars. But actually, when you look at the region properly, once you've been there, you realise there's a layer cake there as well in terms of not just geography, but chronology. So you start off with the Berbers, and the Berbers were the uh, original people who lived in the region. Um, in the Libyan desert, they're the Garamantes. Uh, in Africa, Pro Consularis, they're the Numidians. And then in Mauritania, they're the Maori. But they're all pretty similar, actually. All very famous in the ancient world for being exceptionally fine horsemen uh, and uh, being amazing using the javelin. Uh, and also, they're famous for uh, quite a brutal way of pursuing opponents. One of the reasons Caesar used them in his Gallic Wars was because when they were pursuing a, a beaten opponent, let's say they were foot warriors they were pursuing, they'd ride behind them and hamstring them uh, and then leave them there and able to move carry on in the pursuit and then only come back and dispatch them afterwards um, so they were highly efficient mercenaries in the ancient world um, and 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 
I thought, fair enough. You know, they're very interesting horse people, etc. But when you get to grips with a culture because you're there, you suddenly realise, actually, the Numidians in particular were as powerful in terms of their culture as any Hellenistic kingdom. If you go to any of the, the, the biggest tombs, in actual fact, the biggest royal tombs in the whole region are um, Numidian. And they go all the way down to the Sahara Fringe. And there's the royal tomb, for example, um, uh, between Shershel, um, which is in the west of Algeria, and Algiers, which is more towards the centre, uh, which overlooks the Atlas Mountains and the High Plains. And it's absolutely monumental and it's Hellenistic. So you have this people there, the Numidians in particular, but the Berbers more broadly, who are far, far more um, developed and cultured than most people actually give them credit for today. So that was a real eye-opener. Then you have the Carthaginian phase coming in, the Phoenician settlers, and then later becoming the Carthaginians who fought the Punic Wars of the Romans. Uh, and I thought they were the major dominant power in the region, but actually you really get the sense actually what you have here is a colonial power who got a thin veneer of control over the local territory, but it remains Numidian in culture. And then the Romans are very clever once they take over because they buy the, the, they, they make sure the Numidians, as the Romans did when they created new provinces, they brought the local elites in rather than keeping them out. So the Numidian and Maori and Garamantes elites were brought into the Roman way of life. So you have this very stable region during the Roman period, at least ostensibly, uh, which, which really succeeds uh, until uh, towards the very end of the Roman period, when, of course, then the Vandals invade and take over. You have the Vandal phase. Then you get the Byzantines coming back, which we'll touch on later, I guess. And then finally, you get the Arab conquest coming through. So this is huge, huge layer cake of chronology, but all infused and embedded initially by the local Berber population population who remain the dominant local population to this day and it's, it's a nice bit of context there for us to understand uh roman and pre and post roman uh north africa because as as we've already said it, it addresses so many misconceptions that we have on the region so many misconceptions about how we feel this region acts now there's there's one important thread throughout your book that i really want to add a little bit of context on before we go and touch on the mighty and awesome vandals and it's it's the idea of christianity and religion now christianity has been incredibly powerful through most of what our western understanding of history but how does christianity play a a role in north africa and with the vandals and with rome after that conversion in two, in two ways. Firstly, broadly with Christianity, everywhere I went in the region, and I've been previously, you know there's a, there, there, there's a very overt sense of Christianity because Christianity swept through North Africa broadly sort of uh, in the second and third centuries. And as it was swept through, <clears throat> you get a sense of industrial scale Christianization taking place at each place it visited. So the, the, the baptistries in particular... Jamila is an example I've mentioned on the front cover. And there's an image of this in the book, actually, the baptistry at Jamila. It's massive, it's absolutely massive. So we were able to sit around the seats where the uh, where the individuals about to be baptised sat, and then we were able to stand in front of the bishop's seat in front of the font in the centre of the baptistry where we actually baptise the individuals. And it's vast in scale. It's the, the phrase I taught, I said to my guests when I was taking the tour was this this is industrial. This is an entire community over two, three years, everybody being pushed through to be baptized. Uh, and you do get a sense of pushback occasionally. So there's this famous in Jamila again, uh, mosaic of the ass, where you get a play on words in the this this is the house of the richest man, by the way, in the city in the Atlas Mountains, Jamila, uh, who has along a corridor going from part of the house to his bathhouse uh which is full of local symbolism so the peacocks and and um uh, lions and elephants and things like that and in the middle there's an image of a of a of a, an ass with a play on words which is basically say basically uh taking the mickey out of his friends who were converted to Christianity. So there was pushback, but not much. So broadly, the region quickly became Christian. And then because it, it's got a very dense, because it's so rich and so fertile, uh, and very, very, very well connected across the Mediterranean, including the Eastern Mediterranean, you get a, 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 a real spread of ideas and a flow through of ideas. Uh, and, Religion is one of the obvious ones, of course, and you get schisms taking place, and a lot of them begin 
in North Africa. So when Constantine and later Roman uh, emperors are dealing with schisms in Christianity, they're often dealing with issues that originate in North Africa or uh, or, or are centred around North Africa. The obvious one is the Donatists um, against the Nicene Creed. And then later, of course, the Vandals come over with their own interpretation of Christianity, Aryan Christianity. So you end up almost with three different versions of Christianity in play at one time. Um, so... So it works on two levels, as I said. It works on the one level, the one level uh, as, as a level of connection because the whole lot gets quickly Christianized, but then it becomes a, a means of disruption, dislocation, because then you end up with shiven, sh- uh, schisms as well. I, th- I think that adds a nice a nice level of context and layer of understanding for the region and, and for the Vandals and, and their relationship with Rome. Now... This this podcast and this book is is about the Vandals, so I really want to touch on these guys because they're they're awesome. We've already said that they come from above the Rhine; they're a Germanic Germanic tribe. But how were they different from the Romans? Because we have, and I know we've said this so many episodes. A lot of our understanding of different groups in the Roman world come from the Romans. So, what do the Romans think of the Vandals? First, well, the first thing to point out is for the Romans, you were either Roman or you weren't. And if you were Roman, no matter where you were from in the Roman Empire, whether you're from the Syrian frontier or from the far north of Britain, if you're within the empire, and you're Roman, you're in. And if you're from outside of the empire, you are out. And the Romans call them barbarians. And I, I talk a lot about the term barbarians in the book, actually, the way that the Romans treated anybody from outside their empire as other very very other which is which which makes it very easy then for the romans to dehumanize any of their opponents from outside by the way the romans called the sunny persians barbarians as well to contextualize who culturally and militarily were on the same level as the romans so it wasn't just about capability it was about whether you were in or out so the romans thought the vandals were out and although they, more often than not, won earlier in the Roman Empire when they were fighting people from out, later in the Roman Empire, it becomes much more problematic. And sometimes the Romans won, and sometimes they didn't. But still the people who weren't from in the empire were out. And then you get towards the end of the empire in the West, remember this fun in AD 4, 7, 6, you start to get uh, Germanic peoples who are so powerful in terms of the size and scale of the confederations at a time when the Roman military capability was waning that the Romans couldn't kick them out. And so they ended up staying in. And the whole thing becomes much more problematic for the Romans. And the Vandals are the preeminent example. The Visigoths did the same kind of thing, the Ostrogoths. But the Vandals are the ones that did the same kind of thing. So AD 406, the Rhine Freezers, uh, a mass confederation of Germans that the Romans call the Vandals, plus their allies, who are Alans, who are Iranian horsemen, a local Germ- Germanic Suebi, cross en masse and then spend uh, 406 to 409 hacking their way through two points of ingress through Gaul. And the Romans can't stop them. And it's only in 408 to 409 when a Roman usurper from Britain called Constantine the Third starts intercepting their lines of communication back north over the Rhine, that the the Vandals uh, find themselves on the Pyrenean frontier and cross into Spain. They then spend the next 20 years, 409 to 429, in Spain. And they're there in such numbers that the Romans can't defeat them. So the Romans hire them out as local federate mercenaries for each of their provinces in Spain. And then gradually, as you get a crisis in Rome and Ravenna in the Roman imperial centre for control of the throne, control over Spain diminishes for a period, and that's when the Vandals really flex their muscles. And then ultimately, on four, in 429, they are able to cross again en masse with the Alans and Suebi, uh, although very few Suebi by then, so mostly Alans, into North Africa. And then you have this conquest period going through... Um, the next three, uh, few years um, where they eventually find themselves in Hippo Regis, uh, which is the modern city in Algeria of Annaba. Uh, and that's where they announce the first kingdom, the Vandals and Alans. And then finally, ultimately, the Romans lose a few years later again, and the Vandals capture Carthage, and you end up with the whole of North Africa hacked out of the Roman Empire, which is such a big deal that the, the Roman state can't let it go. 
both the Western Empire in its last years and then the Eastern Empire tried numerous times to get this massively important cultural, economic, intellectual powerhouse region back into the empire and they failed and they failed spectacularly spectacularly right because they're fighting geyseric um who's this incredibly powerful successful vandal king um calls himself the last of the romans which by the way is true in a sense because it's geyseric who sacks rome in 455 when valentinian the third <clears throat> valentinian the third is assassinated <clears throat> This is where the Romans get the name Vandals, which we use today because of the sack of Rome. Um, he sacked Rome because Valentinian III was going to marry his daughter, Eudo Eudokia, to his son Hunneric, and that was cancelled. So Rome is sacked. So Eudokia then gets taken back to Carthage. Remember, it's still a powerful Roman city, even though it's in Vandal hands. And then she marries Hunneric, Geyseric's son, and their offspring then become a generation of Vandal monarchs. So the last Theodosians, Valentinian III was a Theodosian, the last Theodosians were actually part of the Vandal royal family. So he could really claim to be the last, last of the Romans, Geyseric, just an incredibly powerful man the Romans could never get to terms with. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting development from barbarian north of the Rhine, outsiders, to then being considered the last of the Romans, which would be an awesome movie title, by the way. Uh, in in your book, I want to rewind a little bit to that migrationary moment, the the crossing of the Rhine. How important is that moment, and how rare is that moment? Because you spend a lot of time in your book discussing that moment uh, and what it means for the Vandals, but also what it means for Rome. Firstly, it's a historiography issue for you and I as historians because. There's no classical world reference to a frozen Rhine crossing. It doesn't exist. In actual fact, the first person to come up with the idea that there was a Rhine crossing was Edward Gibbon in the 18th century. So, so there's no classical reference to it whatsoever. What we do know is a mass migration took place over the Rhine near Mainz, which is the major Roman city and legionary fortress on the Rhine. That did take place. That is detailed by the contemporary writers. The next question is, how do you get... Um, I think we estimate not, uh, potentially 90,000 people over. Well, you can't do that over a few bridges. So you're looking at boats maybe, but again, you might struggle there. So, so Gibbon comes up with his hypothesis that the Rhine froze, and then everybody since has taken it as, as, as red. No one's challenged it. So what I did, I used um, scientific data and meteorological data to look how likely it was that at that time, it's New Year's Eve, um, 406, at that time, the Rhine froze. And from the data, it looks as though it's more likely than not it did actually happen. It's all set out in the book, so the reader can all, always form their own views. I just give an opinion, as I say in the book, and then the reader can form their own views. But the data is all there. So for me, based on the data, it looks as though the Rhine almost certainly did freeze. So that gets them over the Rhine into Gaul, much to the surprise of the Romans. Now, you can certainly see how the, the Romans would be taken taken aback by that, and that, that moment of them crossing could probably be relatively relatively scary for the Romans. But then how do they make their next crossing, you know, a decade later from Hispania, where they've been you know, ruling unchallenged, flexing their muscles? How do they make that crossing into North Africa? Again, it's the same kind of thing, actually, but, but here is much more organised. So it's basically an amphibious operation. The key thing to remember is this. You're taking, again, it's meant to be 90,000 people. You're getting 90,000 people off the Straits of Gibraltar. Uh, by, by the way, it's worth reflecting this fact, that, that we see uh, the Mediterranean world today through the prism of our own eyes, with the European north um, and an Arab or Muslim south coast. Okay, That's how we see it. But the Romans didn't. For the Romans, the Mediterranean was their world, um, both ev everywhere around the Mediterranean. It was a Mediterranean empire. And intriguingly, uh, in the later Roman Empire, Mauritania Tingitana, which is um, modern Western Morocco, including the crossing north to uh, Gibraltar, and southern Spain were linked as part of the same administrative region. So they weren't separate at all. They were the same. So this flow through across the Straits of Gibraltar was absolutely normal for the Romans. There's nothing abnormal about it whatsoever. Um, it may as well have been a bridge. That's how normal it was. Um, 
so we've got to see beyond the way we see things through our own work in our own world and see it through the Roman eyes. And for them, North Africa and Spain were linked, intrinsically linked, even administratively, they were linked. However, Geyserich, the key thing for him was to get enough ships to ship over 90,000 people. But this guy is the real deal, and he does, and he gets over. And it, and, and it looks as though uh, he's lucky in his timing because there's internal fighting within the Romans. The guy who's running North Africa, the Romans, is called Boniface or Boniface. And it looks as though he may even have invited Geyserich over to help him fight his opponents back in the imperial capital in the west in Ravenna. But then, after the message had gone through to Geyserich in southern Spain and he began his operation, he may have got uh, had second thoughts and tried to stop it, but he was too late. So by the time the message may have got through from Boniface or Boniface to say, hold on a minute, actually, just wait there, let's just sort it, it was too late. Now remember, Geyserich is like the king of the Rohirrim. He's basically a Germanic mounted king warrior. He can't not keep fighting and winning. Right, he's got to keep going. There's no, oh, we'll have a nice little settle down now. It's not going to work. He's got a warrior elite who need to keep fighting and winning uh, until they've got what they ultimately want, which is fertile land of their own, which they can settle on. And for them, that's only the full conquest of North Africa. So that's what they do. So they then scour Roman North Africa from west to east first to Hippo Regis and later to Carthage, until ultimately the Romans have lost. The Romans could do nothing about it. And actually, I, I, the Roman authors indicate the local Berber population weren't fans of the Vandals, but all the evidence I've seen, including legal documents, is actually they got on really, really well. Because the Vandals basically, all, all they did, they didn't, they didn't. It's, it's exactly the same as the Franks in 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 Gaul, uh, the Ostrogoths in Italy, the Visigoths in Spain. All the Vandal elite did was take over from the Roman elite, but kept the rest going as a going concern. Because they ultimately came to the conclusion once they've got the land to settle, it's easier to get money by taxation than by looting. Because once you've looted it, there's no more money. So actually, I think the Vandals just kept the whole thing going as a going concern, which is why the Romans, by the way, were so keen to get it back because they knew that the wealth was still there. It had not been trashed. That relationship between Boniface and uh, Geyserich, you can see how they both feel that they're going to gain something from it and how that relationship went sour. You can you can see how that has set the seeds for the, the Vandals to, to begin their conquest. And you, you've mentioned about the Berbers being supportive of this, this Vandal conquest what how quickly does this conquest go and what's the the elite reaction to it and the roman reaction to it it's about two or three years before they've conquered ultimately all of north africa through to uh hippo regis and then within another year or two years to before the conquer carthage so the whole lot's wrapped up uh by the middle of the um ad 430s uh, and that's the point when Vandal, the, the kingdom of the Vandals and Alans, comes into being, and the Romans sort of realise what they've lost. They've lost the bread basket, so they're now reliant on a foreign power who looks and dresses like the Romans, by the way. <laughs> a foreign power to supply them with the grain, with agricultural produce from North Africa. They've lost all the revenues from the vast in, imperial estates in North Africa, owned by the emperor or owned by the Senate. There are stories of um, senatorial families who've got huge estates in North Africa having to flee and becoming refugees in Rome or Ravenna because they've lost everything. They've literally lost everything. And um, you can almost get this sense them tapping on the Senate door or tapping on the emperor's throne room door in Ravenna saying, come on, can, can we please go back? We need to get our money back. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 the Romans failed time and again and time and again because they're underestimating their opponent. What Geyserich is very, very good at doing, once in power and he sets in place his kingdom of the Vandals and Alans in, in um, North Africa, is amalgamating the military capabilities of his own mounted horse warriors with the local Roman Berber troops. Um, so the, the troops defending the Saharan frontier continue doing so under the Vandals seamlessly, which means that, that the whole region is protected from the south. Crucially, though, 
he amalgamates the Roman naval capability, which means that as soon as he's got nowhere else to take his, his warrior elites to to conquer in North Africa, they start raiding across the Mediterranean and prove incredibly successful. Remember, this is a period when the Roman Empire in the West is in turmoil and it's beginning its decline. So they raid and settle in Sardinia, in Corsica, in Sicily. And then ultimately, of course, it's in Rome. They, they sack Rome as well. Um, uh, one of the great sacks of Rome, and this is the sack of Rome where real damage was done, actually. And again, to reiterate, this is now why the Romans started using the phrase vandals to describe people who do wanton damage. And it's exactly why we use the phrase today as well it must be so irritating for the romans to have lost that but then for those those people to have taken that territory has become a major thorn in their side as a military power and a naval power yeah to be able to cap- capably sack rome as well it it shows the the significance of that loss but how does their relationship with rome ebb and flow and develop whilst they're in charge of North Africa? We've already touched on sometimes how it gets soured. It's a great question. So the Romans never gave up and wanted to reconquer North Africa and tried numerous times, a couple of times in a very serious way and failed spectacularly. But then you end up with this period of rapprochement between the Vandals and the Eastern Roman Empire. So this is now after 476, and we're now talking about the Byzantine Empire. There's a phrase, again, a modern word, the Byzantine Empire, they would have called themselves Romans, but I'll call it Byzantine, by which I mean the Eastern Roman Empire. And there's a rapprochement largely around religious tolerance because you have friction in North Africa between the Aryan Christianity of the Vandals and the local adherents of the Nicene Creed, uh, which causes problems with the Romans, but ultimately there's a rapprochement. However, Towards the end of the Vandal Kingdom, you get a usurper called Gelima, who is in the royal line, but he usurps his predecessor, who takes over. And he's uh, he's keen to go back to the old ways of putting Arianism at the forefront, which causes friction with the, the great Eastern Roman Byzantine Emperor Justinian I, Justinian the Great. And it's he who puts together the final reconquest of North Africa, which 99 years after the kingdom is founded, the Vandal Kingdom, actually brings it ultimately down, which is the invasion of, uh, with Belisarius, his great general, who in a lightning campaign catches the Vandals at exactly the right moment, in just the way the Vandals with Geyseric had captured the Romans at just the right moment 99 years earlier, that, 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 that defeats and destroys Vandal North Africa. And it's very quick and it's very sudden uh, and then suddenly you end up with North Africa reincorporated for a period of time back into the Byzantine world. Um, but one of the things I picked out, one of the things I really noticed when you go through the chronology of each each city or town you go through in North Africa, uh, 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 in my case last year in Algeria, the Byzantine built environment in the cities is a small fort built right in the centre of the old Roman cities, like on top of the Forum, reusing local stone from the Roman buildings, knocked up in a hurry, full of water troughs for horses, and the sense you get is of frontier outposts. And then the more you dig, you realise what's going on. And this is everywhere, all the way down to the Saharan frontier from the coast, through the mountain ranges and the high plains. What's going on is the, the Byzantines have come back and they ousted the Vandals without realising how popular the Vandals, in my opinion, were with the local Berbers. The local Berbers then aren't on side with the Byzantines when they come back because they have their, um, colloquially, Byzantine way of administering things. That's why we use the word Byzantine for that kind of thing today. Lots of box ticking. They didn't like it. So the Byzantines, when they came back, were unpopular. And I And it's also quite a long way from Constantinople, so I think... Even they've got conquests here. You've got Belisarius then fighting, conquering parts of North Africa. Southern Spain gets dragged back into the Roman world for a period. I get the sense that they weren't particularly popular locally. It definitely comes across in the way that you write it that it felt more like a post the Justinian reconquest. It feels more like an occupying force rather than a established strong kingdom such as the Vandals. Which is really important in our world today. So I've already touched on the fact that North Africa, Roman North Africa, is part of the uh, Arab or Muslim world today. It's not part of the, the Western world. 
as we would see it in in northwest in in, in Western Europe. But it would have been, except for that development, I think, because what happens then is, of course, you get the searing conflagration of the Arab conquest taking place, uh, which um, rips the heart out of Sassanid Persia and then rips the heart out of much of the Byzantine Empire. The Sassanid Persian Empire disappears full stop, one of the great powers of the ancient world. And the Byzantines only just hang on. And then this searing conflagration, like a sort of a lit touch paper, goes shoo, straight through North Africa. And in the space of less than a century, the whole of North Africa and much of Spain is part of the Arab or Muslim world. And I think one of the key reasons is it was much easier for them to win because the local Berbers weren't particularly fond of the Byzantines who were uh, ruling them by that point. And they didn't really mind anybody else coming through to have a go. Somebody else can have a go. Um, and also, one of the interesting things is, I, I argue that a lot of the core components of these early Arab conquest armies were former warriors and generals from the Byzantine or Sassanid Persian armies who just joined the cause. So they p- turned out not only to be welcome, but also exceptionally efficient and proficient. And clearly, because it's a religious crusade, highly motivated as well. And And there's nothing that can stop them. And the root of that is, I think, because the local Berbers didn't like the Byzantines and they were much keener to see somebody else have a go. It's one of those things where you don't realise how how much of an implication certain historical actions have on today's world until you look at them and you investigate them. Uh, and a moment like that has had a substantial impact on the modern world and our modern understanding of territorial lines and divisions between Western Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. Which you're seeing today, you're seeing today. And the, and the key thing, this, this is a beautiful, um, very elegant way of going back all the way through to your, your first question about what motivated me to write the book, and I said it was travel. When you travel to places you're writing about, and I really encourage your listeners to try to do this when they're doing their own research, it actually opens your eyes and enables you to see, because you're talking to local people who have a different view of the world to you, for example. That's one thing. But also then physically, once you know what you're looking at, with your own eyes, you can start reinterpreting things that you've taken as received wisdom through the prism of the sources that we use on a day-to-day basis in the West. You're using other sources and you're using your own eyes and experiences. And that is when you suddenly get this eureka moment. You say, oh, that's so interesting. And that actually really is. I mean, I can remember, I know exactly where, I was traveling when I had the Eureka moment with Vandal Heaven. I thought, you know what? Oh, that's a brilliant idea for a book. I can I can even remember where. So, so um, to all of your listeners, if you're thinking of doing your own research, whether it's academic or or otherwise, um, travel and try and travel to the places you want to write about. And I, I think that is the the perfect cyclical moment to now move on to our fun question, Simon, because I think you've just rounded up the whole podcast in a lovely cyclical way though I, I love that thank you <laughs> so we were talking before the episode that you've got an awful lot of projects going on this year you don't like january but 2024 sounds like an exciting year for you which project are you most looking forward to this year right this is interesting actually because um I'm going to be filming in Rome, talking about Cerberus at the end of the month in January. I've got three uh, three of the filming projects, uh, which I've got lined up. But one of the things I want to do is I'm planning to travel to northeastern Greece because I have a long-term project where uh, I want to really examine the relationship between the Macedonians and the Republican Romans. And I've always wanted to go to three battlefield sites in particular, uh, Karnosophile, uh and Pydna, and between them, Magnesia in Turkey. And I want to visit these sites where the Roman legions absolutely butchered the Macedonian phalanx, to stand there in person, look at the lay of the land, and begin to understand where at this key point in Roman history they began to get the ascendancy over the Hellenistic world. <laughs> so, so only by smidgen, but that's probably what I'm looking forward to most. I, I think that's I think that's a brilliant, brilliant answer for that. You know, to look at something, as you said, the importance of looking at something that you're writing about is is probably one of the most important things in history. 
uh, and, and history writing. So I think that's a that's a great answer. And you get to enjoy the sun as well, which I know you love. So. I love it. Yeah, I absolutely love it. So obviously, people are going to want to go away and, and grab a copy of this book, interact with you online. So where can they get a book and, and, and talk to you and ask you questions? Uh, people can always find me at my website where my email address is if they want to ask any questions. That's uh, at Simon Elliott uh, 20, which is my website. Uh, I, I proliferate uh, with my images, which I let people use for free, um, and my research on Twitter, which is again at Simon Elliott 20. Um, I'm on Insta as well, which you'll be able to find me easily. And then in terms of the books and the research, uh, it'll uh, Vandal Heavens out early February and it'll be available on all major online platforms in all major bookshops around the world. And I will make sure a description for all of them is in the all of those. What, what's my English doing today? All of those in the description below, so you can grab a copy of Vandal Heaven, which I thoroughly recommend you do because it is a great read, and you can go away and interact with Simon. So thank you Cheers, very much, mate. Simon, for coming on. Always a pleasure. Thank you for having me. So thank you very much for listening to this newest episode of the History of Jackson podcast. I've really enjoyed talking to Simon about the context of Roman North Africa, what that province what that diocese was like, but also discussing the Vandals, who they were, what they were like pre-North African conquest, and then whilst they were in charge of that region. It's fascinating history that we don't often look at in our everyday history experiences. Now, if you enjoyed this content or any of the content that we create here at History of Jackson, such as the blog, or the book reviews, or the videos, please do consider heading to the Buy Me A Coffee profile in the description below to support us to continue to do what we do here. Or, if you have Apple Podcasts, consider joining History Jackson Plus to support us as well. In the meantime, next week we've got another awesome episode lined up. I know you're going to enjoy it, and I hope you all have a lovely week.